Welcome to Angels in the Glen. In this study, we're going to identify what the stone is, who the stone is, and what this great mountain that fills the whole earth. In the last study, we saw Daniel give King Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of his dream. He sees a great image, a metal man, chest, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And Daniel goes on to explain that these would be kingdoms. He said, you, O king, are the head of gold. But after you, another kingdom inferior will arise. And another kingdom, a third kingdom, followed by a fourth kingdom. And we saw when we unpacked it in that last lesson was we moved from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome to divided Rome or to Europe. And so that's the end of that image. So we want to talk about the stone. Who is this stone? What is this stone? And, and let's unpack that right now. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is a choice and precious in the sight of God. Verse 6, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Do you know who this is talking about? Yeah, that's exactly right. This is talking about Jesus Christ himself. He is that stone. He is that chief's cornerstone. Continue reading. Verse 7, This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very corner stone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. You see there in verse 8, it talks about stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, stone and rock interchangeable. Okay, so when we read in context stone, we can read rock, same thing, Christ Jesus himself. 1 Corinthians 10, 3, 4. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Look at that. Jesus Christ is the rock. We've got a great study next study in about the blue stone and we'll unpack this particular scripture verse. Luke 20, verse 17. But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Jesus speaking. Verse 18. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Wow, look at the imagery happening in that particular verse. That stone, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces? What imagery does that remind you of? Yeah, it reminds you of Daniel 2. It says, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. That's exactly what happens in Daniel chapter 2. Remember in Daniel chapter 2, it says, it crushed it and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But that stone that struck the image, the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A couple more verses here. Look at Acts 4 verse 10. Pick it up in verse 11. He is the stone which the, was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Here's the key part of the verse, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. Salvation in no one else but Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Scriptures are beautiful here. Psalms 18, verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Last verse I want to point out here, Matthew 7. You know the story. 
Jesus talks about how those who um, act upon, hear and act upon my words may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, on Jesus Christ. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. You see, Jesus Christ is the rock. You know, we can face the rains, the winds, the tempests, but our foundation will not fall because it's built upon the rock. Those that don't build their house upon the rock. In verse 27, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell and great was its fall. Now, some people will say, is the stone the first coming of Christ or the second coming of Christ? That's a good question. However, you have to look at the context of the flow of the scripture verses here. If you see on the screen, you'll see the world empires from Neo-Babylonian all the way to Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe, okay? Transition from the barbaric states through the Middle Ages to modern day Europe. It's not until you get to the feet of toes, the feet of iron and clay, that, you, that the image, the stone, strikes the base of the image, okay? So this would be at the end. Some people will say, but didn't Christ say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? In Matthew 3, John the Baptist even says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Jesus would say in Matthew 4, verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, how is this not the kingdom when Christ came the first time? Didn't he establish his kingdom and his church at the day of Pentecost? Not exactly, especially not according to this particular prophet timeline in Daniel chapter 2. But there is something interesting going on here and I want to unpack that. Take a look at Luke 10, verse 8. Jesus speaking to his disciples, and whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. You might say, isn't the scriptures pointing to that the kingdom of God had come during the time of Jesus? One more verse. Luke 19, verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Okay, they think that God's kingdom is going to appear immediately. And so what does Jesus do? He tells them a parable. This is the parable he tells them. And he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Now that parable, Jesus would be talking about himself. Jesus is the nobleman. Okay, Jesus, after his resurrection, would go to a distant country, would go to a distant country, to heaven, receive a kingdom for himself, and then he would return. That's the second coming. He has to receive the kingdom first and then return. And this is exactly what we see happening in Daniel 7. In verse 13, it says this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. We're going to unpack this more in detail when we get to Daniel 7. I just want to get you to see this, that the Son of Man in Daniel 7 verse 13 is Jesus Christ. He comes up to the Ancient of Days, that's referring to God the Father. He's presented before him, and what happens in the verse? It says, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Remember, Jesus even says to Pilate in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Okay, Jesus would go to receive that kingdom in heaven and then return. However, what's interesting is this play on word or the close 
association between the Hebrew words stone and sun. Because if you take a look at the Hebrew word for stone, it's eben. If you take a look at the Hebrew word for sun, it's ben. You see that eben, ben? See, what's going on here is Christ is the stone, Christ is the kingdom. Okay? So when Christ manifested himself in his first coming, he was the kingdom. The kingdom of God came near to us, okay, in the personhood of Jesus Christ. All right? But we're talking about when Christ returns a second time, physically manifests himself at the second coming, destroys all world kingdom systems, and sets up God's kingdom that will endure forever and it won't be given to another people. And see, the kingdom of God is near to you right now, dear heart. The kingdom of God is near to us because when we accept Christ, when we accept that he has died for our sins and we surrender to him our lives as Lord and Savior, the kingdom of God dwells within us because Christ dwells within us. Beautiful scriptures here, okay? So this is what's happening. And that, that kingdom would grow into a great mountain, just like that mustard seed would grow into a great tree, okay? What's the mountain? It grows into, that stone grows into a great mountain. Isaiah 2 verse 2 says this, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways. Okay, this is Mount Zion. This is God's heavenly kingdom. This is God's kingdom that will be established forever and ever. After Daniel tells the interpretation of this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar is blown away. In verse 46 of Daniel 2, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. Now that verse is amazing to me because King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't bow to anybody. He doesn't do homage to anybody. He is the king of Babylon. He has absolute authority and rule over everyone. He can raise one up. He can put one down. Now here, Daniel tells this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, interprets the dream. King Nebuchadnezzar is just on the edge of his seat, and now he realizes he's interacting with the Most High God. And it says this, in verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Have you been counting along the number of times mystery appears in Daniel chapter 2? Yeah, you would have counted eight times it appears. And I only make that point in this broader sense because there's a mystery going on. And in Revelation 10 verse 7, it says this, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he was about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants the prophets. We want to unpack what that mystery is. It's an amazing discovery in the Bible, because the seventh trumpet has sounded. We'll unpack that when we get to Revelation. The mystery of God is finished. We're going to explain what is that mystery. Okay, it's a beautiful understanding of God is preparing his people because he is about to return. We're living in the final days. We are absolutely living in the final days. I just want to unpack a couple more things in terms of this metal man image. Let's go back to it. In verse 31, it says, a great statue. Okay, it's in... It's one great image. Take, take a look at the value of the metals in this picture here. What's happening to the value of the metals? If you move from gold to silver, from silver to bronze, from bronze to iron, iron to clay, what's happening to the value? Yeah, no question. You see a deterioration. You see a, a value going lower and lower and lower. Okay? Um, what else do you see here? Some would say that that would be a degradation, a fall in civilization. 
What else do you see here going on with these metals? How about the strength of the metals? What's happening to the strength of the metals? If you go from gold to silver, silver would be a bit stronger uh, than, than gold. Uh, bronze is a little bit more harder, right? Iron, much stronger, right? So you see a strength increasing in metals. Okay, deteriorating in value, but strength increasing. Many people would say this would be the military might of the kingdoms as you move down in succession. Rome crushed, Rome trampled, Rome destroyed everything in its wake. Most devastating empire. How about the density of the metals? Have you ever thought about that? Density of the metals? I mean, what you really have is you have a top heavy metal man you're looking at. Gold is the most dense. Silver is a little bit less dense. Uh, bronze is less dense. Iron even less. Iron and clay even less. So you have a very top heavy figure here. And that doesn't seem like it would be a stable figure. You don't build things that are top heavy. It's easy to topple over, which really emphasizes the point that world kingdom systems cannot last. They cannot endure, especially with a base of iron and clay. How about the types of metals? Okay. We really just covered that. I mean, we have the gold. I mean, what's the significance of gold? Okay, well, uh, gold in Babylonian times, I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar and those kings basically decorated their temples with gold, overlaid them with gold because it was about glory and splendor. But when you move to Medo-Persia, they're not so much about glory and splendor. They're about riches. Daniel 11 verses 1 and 2 would even point to that. Okay, they're about gathering money, collecting money, uh, raising money gaining wealth, and silver would be representative of coins, of money exchange. If you go to bronze, though, significance of bronze, clearly pointing to the Greek empire. I mean, you have bronze shields, you have bronze helmets, you have bronze breastplates, you have even their chariots were overladen with bronze in terms of the wheels of their chariots and everything. Clearly pointing to Greece, Rome, Edward Gibbons, the famous historian, writes his book, The Fall of the Roman Empire in 1776, said the Iron Monarchy of Rome. I mean, Rome was just strong as iron. And this is what they, they, they had their iron shields and swords. Um, you move, so types are very interesting here. Um, what else do we see here? This is one great image, right? It's really an idol, okay? I mean, this is an idol, and it's something that is uh, an abomination to the Lord, right? God says, don't make any idols unto yourselves. Don't make it in heaven above, earth below, or the waters under. Don't make anything that would be an idol that you would worship, okay? And the place where people worship idols and images is at the feet, okay? That's exactly where the stone would strike the image and completely destroy it. Uh, notice also uh, two more things. Transit, the transitory nature of these kingdoms. Okay, You move from Babylon, head of gold, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, Europe, very temporary kingdoms Okay, in the world scheme of things, but God's kingdom will endure forever. The last thing I point out about this image is the head, the head of gold. Remember, it's a single unit. Okay, the head, as we know, the head controls the body, right? So the principles of Babylon would continue and permeate through these world kingdom systems in terms of not recognizing God and oppressing God's people, okay? That attitude of pride, we'll see when we get to Daniel 4, would permeate through these other world kingdom systems all the way down to the time of the end. Now, this last verse I want to point out to you is this, Romans 15, verse 4. Because you have to ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of prophecy? Why are we studying this? Okay, that's very interesting. We got a nice history lesson on the transitory kingdom and everything. But why is this important? It's important because prophecy gives us hope. Okay, prophecy gives us hope, hope for the future. Okay, we know what to look for. God is giving us an understanding of what is going to happen, what has happened, and what will happen. His return. That's beautiful. To have hope in the future? 
Romans 15 verse 4, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. You see, these scriptures are teaching us through perseverance we might endure, okay? And we'd hope in the future. See, you know, life can crush us just like this iron was crushing. And whatever we may be going through in life, whatever happens at work or with our families or in our marriages or in our personal life, whatever may happen, God is still the God of your life and He wants you to have hope. Okay? That's why prophecy was given to us. There is a God in heaven and He cares about you. Okay? He's giving you... A sparrow can't even fall to the ground okay, without Him knowing it. Can't even fall to the ground. You know, what was tough was we just lost our little dog. Um, Jamie had her for 11 years, much closer than I was to her. And um, we talked about this, that, you know, she taught us so many lessons and it was tough to lose her. She had a stroke. There was nothing we could do about it. Little Pomeranian and not even a sparrow can fall. And while it really touched our hearts and it hurt us, I know you may have lost a pet. Uh, They were part of the family. But not even a sparrow can fall. And we know that, you know, God saves man and beast. That's clear in, I think it's Psalms 37. But this is the beauty of what God, no matter what troubles we're going through and everything, God gives us hope through these scriptures. And our lives are just fleeting, temporary troubles that we go through. And Christ Jesus is returning and victory is certain for God's people. Beautiful study here. So in closing, Um, I just want you to be encouraged by this, by this prophecy. Prophecy was given to us so that we might have hope and that we would be looking to the soon return of Christ Jesus. In the next study, we're going to cover a a wonderful study about the blue stone and we're going to unpack deeper truths about God's law, about Jesus Christ himself, and about God's throne. Let's close out in prayer. Father God, thank you for these scriptures and we just thank you for your word and that we know that Christ is returning. And give us hope and perseverance as we wait for him, his soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as always, we've got study guides for you. Go ahead and download those and it'll help you in your personal studies as you go through each scripture verse and it just reinforces what we talked about here. I really encourage you to go through in your personal time and and unpack that. We're just looking forward to you next time because next time we're going to talk about some amazing truths called the blue stone. You might say, what is the blue stone all about? And we're going to unpack that next time. But basically, there are amazing truths about God's law, about Jesus Christ, and about God's throne. And we'll see you next time.